Hallo, alle liebe Freundinnen und Freundinnen des Kreisky-Forums. Ich freue mich sehr, dass wir Ihnen heute einen Vortrag oder einen kurzen Vortrag von einer ganz renommierten und gewichtigen Stimme aus den USA präsentieren können. Wie Sie wissen, haben wir in unserer Transatlantiker-Serie immer daran gedacht, nicht nur den Blick aus Europa auf die USA zu präsentieren, sondern auch den Blick aus den USA auf Europa. Und hier äh, ist Vivian Schmidt eine, eine sehr maßgebliche Wissenschaftlerin von der Boston University. Sie hält dort den Lehrstuhl, den Jean Monnet Lehrstuhl für europäische Politik und hat sich in, in ihrem wissenschaftlichen Leben immer sehr intensiv mit Europa und den Entwicklungen in der Europäischen Union beschäftigt. Ihr letztes Buch, über das sie in dem kurzen Video sprechen wird, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers, beschäftigt sich mit einigen sehr grundlegenden und wesentlichen Fragen in der Entwicklung der Europäischen Union. Sie beschäftigt sich mit den Fragen der Legitimität, und zwar der Legitimität auf verschiedenen Ebenen, Legitimität in den Institutionen, äh, demokratische Legitimität, politische Legitimität, aber letzten Endes auch dann Legitimität in den Entscheidungen, die in Europa getroffen werden und wurden, äh, getroffen wurden im Zusammenhang mit der großen Finanz- und Wirtschaftskrise und der, der Euro-Krise der, der Jahre äh, 2008 bis 2015. Darüber hinaus aber auch mit den Auswirkungen der Covid-Krise auf das institutionelle Gefüge der Europäischen Union. Ich hoffe, dass wir Vivian Schmidt, die wir schon öfters im Kreisky Forum begrüßen konnten, auch bald wieder real und als Person bei uns haben können und wünsche Ihnen viel Vergnügen für eine interessante und wirklich maßgebliche Präsentation. Hello. I'm Vivian Schmidt, Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration in the Pardee School at Boston University. I'm delighted to be speaking to the friends of the Bruno Kreisky Forum about my new book, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone. As the title suggests, the book focuses on questions related to the Eurozone crisis. I use legitimacy as the lens through which to examine political economy, politics and governance in the Eurozone crisis. But of course, the book is more than just about that crisis. It addresses the nature of legitimacy in the European Union more generally, while offering tools for analysis that apply equally to other crises, such as the COVID-19 panic then, that we are currently living through. So what about the Eurozone crisis? This was a crisis that was not only about economics, it was also about politics and democracy. The problem with the Eurozone crisis is that in terms of governance, is that it was all about governing by rules and ruling by numbers. And this put democratic legitimacy at risk. What we saw were, as a result of such governance, deteriorating economics and increasingly toxic politics. EU institutional actors, however, recognizing these problems, did begin to reinterpret the rules and numbers, but by stealth. This was after the first two years. This led to incremental improvements, but still suboptimal rules and perceptions of illegitimacy. As we saw such reinterpretations, without admitting to it, Southern Europeans continued to feel oppressed even when they were accommodated, and Northern Europeans felt deceived regardless. The result is continued perceptions of illegitimacy. So how do we define legitimacy before we go any for, for, farther? Two ways to define legitimacy. One is as a governing authority, which has its basis in public consent and trust, and that's the normal way in which we think of legitimacy. But there's also legitimacy in terms of governing activities. And here we can talk about policy effectiveness. This is about output legitimacy in my terms or performance. Another way, the second way, is about political responsiveness, citizen participation. This is input legitimacy. And finally, and the one in which I focus mostly on the book, is about procedural legitimacy. It's throughput legitimacy. 
And here it's the quality of the procedures, the quality of the governance. And these are five basic criteria, efficacy, accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, and openness. So what about the Eurozone crisis and the EU more generally in terms of legitimacy? I guess the first question would be, is the EU democratically legitimate? As a governing authority, yes. And this was established in policy area after policy area over time. As a democracy, well, not the EU itself, but certainly its member states. So we could talk about this as a kind of split level legitimacy, where performance and procedural legitimacy are focused at the EU level, political legitimacy at the national. But as such, there are serious problems for national level democracy, simply by the very presence of the EU. As the EU takes more and more policies up to the EU level, national politics is emptied of substance. But okay, that's under governing authority, but what about governing activities? Generally speaking, over the years, I argue that EU governing of activities have actually reinforced EU governing authority, except more recently, with the EU's failure to solve its many crises, and in particular, in the Eurozone crisis. We can see this uh, probably best in terms of the Janus-faced perceptions of European actors in terms of their procedural legitimacy to begin with. What about the European Central Bank? Was it a hero saving the Euro? Certainly. But couldn't we also see it as an ogre demanding the, of all member states, austerity, and pushing countries, the most vulnerable countries, into harsh austerity programs and demanding massive structural reforms, in particular as a member of the Troika. And what about the council? Was this a dictatorship led by Germany as creditor states imposed on weaker debtor states? Or was it a mutually accountable deliberative body? After all, everyone went along with austerity and structural reform. So one could argue that on dictatorship or mutually accountable deliberative body for normal countries, our conclusion is open to question. But for the Troika, in terms of program countries, here I think the only alternative views are harsh austerity or deliberative authoritarianism. And what about the commission? Here we could ask, were they ayatollahs of austerity? as in the first two years, demanding rapid deficit reduction and massive cuts in welfare and uh, deregulation of labor markets via the European semester? Or could we argue that they were actually ministers of moderation as they ease the rules, as they reinterpret the rules, admittedly by stealth in the first two years, uh, sorry, in the first three years after the first two? And what about the parliament? Is it a talking shop or a potentially equal partner? Certainly in the beginning, it had little or no role in the Eurozone crisis. But increasingly, it acted as a form of accountability through investigations, through hearings, and as the go-to body for other institutional actors seeking to demonstrate their own accountability. So for these four EU institutional actors, we can see that legitimacy, well, in some ways, they seem to have redeemed themselves as time went on, but certainly initially highly problematic in terms of legitimacy, procedural legitimacy. But what about performance legitimacy, the effectiveness of the policies, or political responsiveness, political legitimacy? Certainly if we look at the policies, there was a massive lack of economic effectiveness and performance. We saw slow Eurozone growth for everyone. Major contrast and revealing contrast comes with the United States. But in particular, increasing unemployment and poverty in Southern Europe and rising inequalities everywhere. That's the policies. And in terms of the politics, there was almost no citizen participation and there was also a lack of elite responsiveness. In the economics, people increasingly felt left behind. In the sociocultural, you saw many worried about the loss of socioeconomic status and increasing blaming immigrants for all these problems. And 
in terms of the political sources, anger about a loss of political control. The result is that subsequent to the Eurozone crisis, we see an increasing populist challenge to liberal democracy. The good news, however, with all of this, is that EU actors seem to have learned some of the lessons of the Eurozone crisis in the COVID-19 pandemic. The EU at first, admittedly, was very slow to start here. It was inefficacy in terms of the procedures. It looked like the Eurozone déjà vu all over again, the council unaccountable. The ECB claimed it was not its mandate to deal with spreads between German and Italian bonds. The European Parliament, again, no role. The commission was nowhere. On top of this, the migration crisis seemed, you know, to come back again as national levers, national level borders went up. However, things quickly changed. The member states threw out the Eurozone crisis budgetary austerity with massive infusions of money. The ECB, after its initial misstep, became the hero, just as in the Eurozone crisis, without the ogre-like demands for austerity and structural reforms. The Council was not a dictatorship led by Germany in this case, but a deliberative mutual accountable body pushed by the German-Franco duo. The Commission, unlike in the Eurozone, it was not at all ever Ayatollahs of austerity, but rather from the very beginning ministers of moderation as it suspended the budgetary criteria to allow unlimited governance spending, as it recommended masses amounts of money to spur growth and investment and and on. In short, the EU seems to have learned many of the legitimacy lessons of the Eurozone crisis, with the exception of a few member states, the frugal four, among them the Austrian government. But of course, there is still some ways to go, because the populist revolt that stems in part from citizen reaction to the Eurozone crisis and now the pandemic, is not over, and the governing by rules and ruling by numbers of the Eurozone have only been suspended, not officially revoked, while the Eurozone still lacks many of the necessary instruments to ensure optimal performance. But the response to the COVID crisis, which reverses some of the worst legitimacy lapses of the Eurozone, is at least a very good start. There we go. Thank you.